hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians were forcibly deported through Russia from Ukrainian territory. Many have experienced terrible things like the filtration camps on the borders, separation from families, cruel interrogations by the Russian troops, and of course being forced to live in another country, an enemy country without money or documents in many cases, left stranded and struggling to leave Russia by themselves. Some, like children, do not even have the option to try to return home or to go to Europe. Russia has shamelessly shown children being brainwashed to believe their country is wrong in resisting Russian aggression and to position Russia as their liberator. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce and our material is now available on the popular podcast platforms as well. Ksenia Terkova is a journalist and a linguist with a PhD in philology, language and literature. She has both Russian and Ukrainian backgrounds and has worked in both countries for private as well as independent media. Her specialist area of research is studying media texts and propaganda. Ksenia is a guest lecturer at American universities and also runs a YouTube channel which offers analysis of the current events from the point of view of the nuances of language. And Ksenia, this is your second time on the channel and um, I'm really pleased to welcome you back. Thanks for having me. And we're going to tackle uh, what is a really tough topic today and it's about the uh, theft, the abduction of children from Ukraine how they're treated but of course we're also going to touch on how children in russia are also treated and used for propaganda purposes and this isn't an easy topic we've covered it now in in two or three videos on the channel but i think every time it's very tough to record these and i think it's difficult for the audience to to listen to these stories but it's absolutely essential to do that isn't it um, yes, it's uh, one of the topics I am uh, very much uh, into because uh, it's a kind of a personal topic for me because I have an adopted uh, son uh, adopted in Russia and uh, he was adopted in 2010, uh, two years before uh, the <clears throat> law of Dima Yakovlev, uh, the, which was a, a law, uh, the, the symmetrical, symmetrical so-called answer to Magnitsky law. Uh, when this law was uh, signed uh, in Russia. Uh, and uh, so it became kind of a personal, uh, very personal topic for me. Uh, so I um, I follow all the news and uh, I do some uh, research and uh, I interview people. Uh, so I usually, usually it's one of the topics I cover uh, for now for Voice of America or for like places I work for. And the last time we covered this topic, it was before the ITC issued uh, its uh, its sort of warrant for the arrest of Putin, but also significantly Lvova Bilova. Um, and this is a, a really critical moment, and it's helping to shine a light, isn't it, on this terrible part of the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. Uh, well, we I think we see the results already because after that warrant was issued, actually Russia started returning kids uh, to Ukraine, some of them, because uh, a huge amount of uh, kids is still uh, in Russia. Uh, the kids um, who were um, basically stolen from Ukraine, from their parents, from the families, uh, but they started that process uh, slowly. And uh, I think that was uh, uh, that was the role that Warrant played. And I uh, I talked to the lawyer who actually the French lawyer who initiated that uh, warrant, uh, and uh, he told me the same thing uh, that in his opinion it uh, helped. We saw it almost immediately. Uh, the next week or in next several days, uh, uh, some kids were uh, returned uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so although in Russia they said that uh, it doesn't have uh, any uh, sense for them, uh, they they are not going uh, to obey that, uh, that warrant uh, and it doesn't play any significant role. Uh, I think uh, it does play uh, some role and uh, it shows us by uh, what happened because they started returning kids. Um, do we have a sense of how many children were taken from Ukraine? 
And do we have sense of where they are and, you know, what the challenge is in going to be actually uh, returning them? Because, you know, they may not have all the details uh, of, you know, the families and locations of these children. Uh, yes, it's very difficult to locate them uh, because uh, a lot of children, for a lot of children, Russian uh, authorities, they change uh, their names, uh, they change their documents, uh, they change um, their environment and geographical location. So it's very difficult to uh, to understand where they are. Uh, and uh, the numbers also are different because it's it's difficult to to count. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, now they are talking about the Ukrainian authorities are talking about uh, about uh, twenty thousand kids uh, moved to to Russia, uh, but. Uh, Again, uh, it's it's very hard to say. Uh, it's very hard to find out the the particular number. And uh, several days ago, uh, an, an independent uh, Russian speaking media outlet, uh, important stories. Uh, that is labeled as a foreign agent by the Russian government, uh, published uh, an investigation, a, a big article uh, dedicated to those kids. Um, and uh, they uh, went through the state uh, database uh, on orphans and children left without uh, parental care. There is a that uh, huge government resource, that database, and I used it when I was a... Uh, parent to be when I was about to uh, adopt a child. So you go when your paperwork is done, you go to the base and you look for children uh, and uh, from different Russian regions. Uh, regions. And uh, the journalists from uh, that media outlet, Important Stories, they uh, found out, uh, so they did a research and they found out that the last year there was a spike uh, in the number of kids appeared in that base. Uh, and that spike was um, about uh, 2,000 and a half uh, children, uh, so 2,500 children about. Uh, and uh, of course, we can we cannot say that 100 percent of them are Ukrainians, uh, that all of them were stolen from Ukraine. Uh, but uh, obviously, that spike shows us that something was going on, uh, and. Uh, the journalist found some particular children who were from Ukraine. Uh, so they found some proof and uh, they um, came to the conclusion that maybe uh, the majority of those kids are from Ukraine. That's why they had that uh, that uh, that big a uh, big spike. Uh, uh, that system uh, the system does not. Uh, uh, involve um, finding Ukrainian relatives of these uh, children uh, to take them uh, into custody. And in fact, uh, Russia does not provide an opportunity for the children to uh, remain in Ukraine. So for those children who appeared in that uh, database, uh, they don't even mention that uh, they are from Ukraine. Some of them, uh, you can you can find that information, but uh, they, um, uh, they are not trying uh, to to find the Ukrainian relatives or Ukrainian families. So uh, the authorities are trying to push uh, Russian people to adopt uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian children. And some of these children um, will have lost their parents uh, potentially in the war, but others will have uh, parents and relatives who are, you know, trying to track them down. Um, and I think that is one of the tragedies of this, is these children may have been told all sorts of stories about how the state doesn't want them, about how their parents and families don't want them, and, of course, how the Ukrainian state is, you know, evil, and, and all these sort of stories. Do we do we know anecdotally, or do we have any evidence of, uh, you know, what these children are being told uh, when they... Um, either get into state care or or into private families uh, within Russia? Yes, there there is some proof because some of those children, as I said before, uh, were returned uh, to Ukraine and they told their stories. So from them, uh, we know what uh, they are, um, are doing to children there. And uh, they do in those camps, uh, what they call camps of rehabilitation, 
uh, centers um, or because they they put a lot of uh, kids for so uh, in into so called summer camps and uh, telling them they will return to Ukraine after that but a lot of those kids uh, after the summer camps never returned uh, or some of them uh, were put into some rehabilitation facilities or something like that uh, and uh, or um, some kids uh, they found their foster families uh, some of them were adopted uh, because we we can't uh, we can't uh, talk about like legal adoption in those circumstances because it's legal in Russia but it's not legal for for the rest of the world and uh, those children uh, who returned to Ukraine uh, they told some some stories that uh, it's known that uh, they were put into Russian school for example to study uh, Russian language so. Um, all Ukrainian kids, just to understand the situation, all Ukrainian kids, they are, uh, they study in Ukrainian schools in Ukrainian language. So they don't even know the Russian terminology, for example, in math or in science or in other different uh, subjects. So when you put a Ukrainian kid into the Russian school, uh, that kid won't uh, understand anything unless uh, uh, their um, family language was Russian, but still it would be difficult because at school they didn't learn like Russian grammar uh, and uh, it, it was not a common thing, uh, except those kids who were homeschooling. Uh, so uh, it's, um, yes, it's uh, shaping some uh, different identity. It's taking the Ukrainian identity and putting the Russian identity instead. Uh, uh, or they forced them to sing a Russian anthem, uh, and um, they had uh, a lot of kids. They had uh, like patriotic lessons, uh, or, because in every Russian school they have now uh, weekly lessons called um, that talks about important things. And uh, usually they talk about uh, so-called special operation, or they called about uh, Western countries, how bad uh, they are. Uh, or about Ukraine or about some patriotic things uh, like how Russia is a great country and something like that, uh, traditional values. Uh, and uh, so they had those patriotic, uh, patriotic lessons. Uh, some of them met uh, Russian uh, military people, Russian soldiers who came uh, to give some speeches and uh, who told how they served uh, in the special operation, uh, and uh, some of those kids were weaving uh, weaving camouflage nets uh, for the Russian soldiers. So uh, it's uh, I can't even imagine what uh, what could be uh, in in the heads of those kids. So if you are, if you are a Ukrainian kid, you speak Ukrainian, uh, you go to Ukrainian school, and then uh, suddenly. Uh, you are, uh, for for example, you are you are in Russia. You go to Russian school. Uh, you they force you to speak Russian language, sing uh, Russian anthem, uh, and uh, your world is uh, like upside down uh, because now they told you that Ukrainians are, are bad and Russians are good and they, they will save you, uh, and uh, they they force you to weave those uh, nets for Russian soldiers. So it's it's horrible. Uh, it's uh, just killing people's identity. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, there is a uh, some uh, genocidal. Uh, a ge it's a genocidal thing. Uh, it it's not maybe qualified yet like that. But that, by the way, that French lawyer told me that they consider it as a sign of uh, genocide, cultural uh, genocide, um, uh, what they do to Ukrainian kids. And there seems to be, I mean, I was at an event just last week and there were some sort of academic historians there and they're very hesitant to use the term genocide um and yet if you look at this action that's taking place and clearly the icc has issued a warrant because of the genocidal nature 
of what's taking place. Um, it's not simply a crime. It's a crime that has far greater sort of depth and implications to it. But if you take all the criteria of uh, a genocide, um, including you know, attacks on civilian infrastructure, um, torture chambers, all this kind of stuff, there are clear signs, numerous signs, um, that these criteria, every single criteria uh, that would constitute genocide are being met. And yet the media and academics are extremely hesitant to put that label on it in the same way that they've been very hesitant for many years to label the Holodomor as a genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet Ukrainian academics um, will not have you know, quite the same reservations there about using these labels. Do you think this is still an issue? I mean, are, are Western academics and media far too timid in some ways still appeasing uh, Russia? I, I think uh, now it's... They they are less hesitant uh, maybe than than before, uh, and that word appears more and more in the Western media and uh, in in the Ukrainian media, of course. Uh, and uh, as far as I understood from uh, talking to experts, they they see the genocidal nature because uh, it they are trying to erase their their identity. Uh, if you take your name, I, your they you change they change your paperwork. Uh, they take your you out of the family. They change your language. They change your the system of your views, how you see the world. Uh, and I, I think uh, it's uh, it's erasing erasing your identity, and that's why it's seen now as a genocidal uh, nature. And to clarify again here, so clearly these children then are you know if they find themselves with other Ukrainian children or Ukrainian speakers, are they discouraged from speaking Ukrainian? Are they discouraged from reading Ukrainian? And Something you mentioned there is 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 also quite traumatizing. The idea that they would have to russify their names as well. So you think, oh, this this is all definitely a core part of what's happening. Uh, well, I think they change their names because they just want to hide the kids. Uh, but as for the language, I don't uh, know exactly uh, how what what they uh, tell children who wants to speak Ukrainian, uh, because in uh, propaganda they uh, say uh, that we are not against Ukrainian language. We let them speak Ukrainian. We would be happy if uh, they they speak their native language. Uh, we are not against it, not at all. So they are trying to show that uh, they are very uh, open and uh, tolerant uh, towards those kids. So they are not uh, forcing them uh, to um, forget their own language. But at the same time, uh, they, uh, they are saying that uh, those kids, uh, they need to learn Russian better. And even Russian authorities say that uh, openly. Uh, they need to learn Russian better. They need to catch up with Russian because uh, their Russian is not very good, like learning Russian grammar, uh, singing Russian songs and stuff like that. And uh, so they, although they, uh, um, they show their intentions towards Ukrainian language as uh, good, uh, on the other, uh, on the other hand, they, uh, they are showing it as a, again, uh, they are showing that attitude towards Ukrainian as uh, some second sort language. So our first goal, they say, is to uh, uh, to make them learn Russian uh, and to go to the Russian school, to get Russian passports uh, and to study Russian culture. And if they want, of course, we are not against it. They can speak Ukrainian. So they that, uh, that attitude, they, they want to... Try, they want to show themselves as very uh, generous and uh, good, kind people. But in that narrative, we see the real uh, attitude towards Ukrainian language. Uh, it's uh, some some secondary secondary language. We can they can speak it. We are not against it. But Russian is the main thing, and uh, uh, it's also I think it's terrible. Uh, it's terrible.
And we're fairly sure, aren't we, that in most cases, the parents either would not have given permission for the children to leave or they would have given permission for them to attend these camps temporarily and be re returned home. So is it true that we, we don't think anyone has given permission for these children to stay in Russia and certainly not for them to be re-educated? Oh, of course. Not. I, I don't think any of them got some official permission uh, about about those kids no i uh, i don't think so and the situations uh, with uh, those kids are very different as you said uh, uh, some of them lost their parents because of the war uh, so parents were just were killed or died because of the war uh, some of the parents were arrested uh, by uh, russian military forces or pro russian uh, in the occupied uh, Donbass, for example. And so they detained uh, the parent and uh, they sent uh, kids to uh, to Russia. Uh, and uh, there, there were stories like that um, in, uh, in Ukrainian media and in the Western media. Uh, so the situations are, uh, are very different uh, with those kids. And that's incredibly tragic, isn't it? A situation like that. Uh, almost in some instances you, you fear that the parents detained because they've got children that can be taken. Um, do we know what kind of areas they're from? Would this be Kherson, um, sort of Mariupol area, or is it from right across? Uh, I mean, Kharkiv was retaken, but do we know, you know, before it was retaken, were children taken from that region, for instance? Yes, from the, they they were taken from different regions, and as far as I understand, now they are evacuating uh, children from uh, Zaporizhia region, uh, and uh, so b before the counteroffensive, I guess. Uh, so they are trying to to evacuate uh, the children, and that's what was uh, happening uh, in other different regions and uh, in the orphanages, for example, and uh, in the. Uh, different children uh, facilities, uh, the doctors, some doctors were trying to hide children and some of them hid children. So they were trying to, to avoid the situation when the children would be uh, forcefully uh, sent to Russia. Um, and uh, yes, there, there are from uh, different regions. As for the situation uh, when uh, the parent was detained and the ch children were about to be adopted it was a, mm, a real story uh, about uh, about uh, a parent a father from uh, mariupol uh, and uh, he was detained and uh, while he was uh, detained uh, his children were in russia in that summer camp and they told them that uh, they uh, would be adopted and so somehow they reached out to him uh, and uh, they told him like you have five days otherwise we will be adopted uh, and uh, finally finally they reconnected uh, so those stories are, are real uh, when uh, we have uh, parents uh, we have family uh, but kids are still uh, being sent to Russia and uh, they want to put uh, them in different Russian families and that case I read that that one you talked about now the father in this case went through an extraordinary amount of bureaucracy. I mean, he pushed incredibly hard. Um, and that story obviously has ended positively. But the amount of time, expense and effort he had to go through to actually even reach them and then be allowed to take them home. I mean, that is the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Many children will not have either relatives with the means to do that. Um, many will not have parents or relatives that are as resourceful uh, or able to sort of push against that bureaucratic machine. Um, so these stories are heartening, but for the majority of children, um, it, it, it potentially is going to be far harder to reconnect them with their relatives and with their, uh, with their country. Oh, of course. And we know the, we don't know the numbers again. Uh, it's very difficult to fear, figure out what the, what uh, the numbers are. And uh, another category is uh, children uh, from the orphanages uh, who are real orphans. 
and uh, it's known that they moved the whole orphanages uh, from the occupied territories, for for example, or the territories um, that were occupied and then deoccupied. Uh, so they moved the whole uh, facilities, the whole children facilities, and those children. Um, in there are a lot of orphans in Russia. Uh, and uh, although people do adopt <clears throat> do adopt uh, children in Russia, it's still uh, there are still a lot of a lot of orphans. So they add to those orphans Ukrainian uh, children, Ukrainian orphans. They are trying to motivate people uh, artificially to adopt children. They are trying to Russian officials, I mean Russian government. They are trying to stimulate them. Like we will give you money. They are doing this uh, adoption propaganda, and uh, so they uh, they push people uh, to adopt. Uh, what and it happened before the war. It's not uh, something that uh, is happening only now. So they they push people to adopt. But what happens then uh, in uh, different Russian Russia's uh, regions uh, that are not very rich? Uh, people sometimes, unfortunately, adopt uh, kids uh, to get money from the government, uh, and so they're not. Um, uh, they don't feel like they want adopt. They are not prepared for that. They are not ready for that. For that, as as parents, as uh, families, uh, psychologists uh, don't uh, work with them. And uh, I don't know about now. I think now it's more difficult. Uh, but when I adopted, the process was very easy. Uh, and uh, so uh, my point is that. Uh, People adopt children and then they return them uh, to the orphanages. And the um, numbers of returning children uh, are huge in Russia. Uh, and uh, th there are some researchers who um, say that that uh, the numbers of returning uh, are, are very big. Uh, and uh, so now they add to that huge amount of uh, Russian orphanages, they add uh, stolen Ukrainian orphan, uh, orphans. Uh, and I don't know what is the purpose. Why, why do they need those kids? Uh, who will adopt them? Uh, and uh, wouldn't it be like it was before, uh, as I said, with, with the Russian children? Maybe they will push people to adopt and they will adopt uh, return children or something else will happen. So it's it doesn't make any sense. Uh, first of all, it's not uh, legal according to the international law. But even we are, even if we are talking just about like practical things, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any logic uh, for me. If you have so many orphans. You need to deal with your own orphans. Why do you want to steal uh, the kids from uh, other countries? But they uh, picture it as a um, how they, uh, you know, they use that special language. They say that they, when they occupy Ukrainian cities, they say that they liberate them. And uh, now uh, about the children, they say that uh, they are saving Ukrainian children, uh, that they uh, they are taking care of them. So they are picturing themselves uh, as uh, rescuers, as uh, uh, saviors, uh, as, uh, for example, that um, woman, Maria Lvova Belova, uh, she is a hero uh, in Russian propaganda. Uh, they picture her as a, as a hero uh, who is saving um, little kids, uh, always wants to help, and uh, he, um, she has uh, a lot of kids herself adopted and uh, uh, her biological kids. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I just don't know why, why, do, why do they need it? And this takes us back, I think, to the genocidal rhetoric. I mean, first of all, Maybe they think that this, you know, kidnapping of children, maybe that creates terror or fear. And they think, you know, like the bombing of um, uh, energy infrastructure in Ukrainian cities, maybe they think that it serves some purpose as a terror weapon. But it seems to me that even worse than that, from what you're saying here, is that, you know, they may also see these children as not Ukrainians, but as 
Russians that have gone bad. And this is part of the rhetoric we hear from many of the TV propagandists. Ukrainians are the same as Russians, just something's gone wrong in their heads. You know, they're misguided. They've become Nazis. They've become this, that. Right. And um, those kids, by the way, who uh, returned to Ukraine, they uh, told uh, stories how they were bullied uh, by Russian kids because they were Ukrainians. Yes. I mean, that... that um, I mean, that has a long history, doesn't it? Um, the pressure on children to not speak Ukrainian was was strong uh, during the Soviet period. And using, um, you know, tools like in embarrassment, uh, mockery, ridicule, and looking at both Ukrainian language and literature as sort of not just secondary, but almost like a sort of peasant language rather than a high civilized cultured language. Um, but if you take that kind of prejudice, historic prejudice, and then combine it with what we're hearing from the uh, propagandists, which is that almost, you know, Ukrainians need to be converted, need to be turned back into good Russians or else eliminated. I mean, these are some of the phrases that only recently we've heard on Solovyov uh, and uh, even, you know, Simonyan and, and these these kind of people on their shows. Um do you think this abduction and reprogramming of children sort of fits in with what we're hearing in, in other areas? Uh, yes, it fits in what we hear in other areas. But for me, it doesn't add up with that rhetoric I just uh, were talking I was talking about uh, when they say that we're saving Ukrainian children, let's help them. They're suffering from uh, from war, from uh, their Nazi government, uh, and uh, let's let's help them. It doesn't. Uh, there is a, a con contradictory between uh, those two parts of that uh, two parts of propaganda uh, narrative about Ukraine, because if you. 24 hours uh, per day, uh, you are talking about how bad Ukraine is, uh, how bad Ukrainian people are, Ukrainian language doesn't exist, and uh, they're all Nazis, and so on. And then, uh, for example, uh, let's um, imagine some average Russian kid who is watching TV with uh, his family, uh, with, with their family. And uh, so uh, they are watching uh, those TV channels. Uh, they are listening to all those narratives about Ukraine and the Ukrainians. And then suddenly they go to school and uh, uh, figures out that they put uh, a couple of Ukrainian kids in, in, in their class. What would be the reaction after that? Uh, I don't think the kid, especially if it's a teenager, uh, because it's a, a difficult uh, time, you know, the difficult age. Uh, I don't think that a kid will be very kind to those Ukrainian uh, kids. And there is a high risk of um, bullying. Uh, so uh, it's a contradictory, it doesn't, uh, again, it doesn't make any logic. So one narrative uh, doesn't support another uh, narrative of uh, propaganda. And we see uh, the real uh, intention and the real um, uh, the real thoughts of uh, Russian government uh, of uh, Ukraine and uh, and Ukrainian people and Ukrainian children in particular. And of course, Russian children themselves are subject to fairly intense uh, propagandizing, aren't they? Now, from uh, kindergarten onwards, we see children being used to make sort of Z patterns um, and uh, dress as tanks and all this kind of stuff. Um, now, this sort of thing has, has sort of always gone on and it was big in the Soviet Union, but it seems to have been intensified over the last year, the militarization of education. Um, so what can we tell about what's actually going on in Russian schools? I think it started not uh, a year ago, not after the full-scale war against Ukraine started. It started after the uh, annexation of Crimea, 
uh, and uh, I remember that time uh, very very well because I just uh, I moved to Ukraine uh, from Russia to Ukraine in 2013. Uh, but I was visiting my family in Russia very often, so I went uh, I went to Russia pretty often during uh, 2014 2015. Uh, years and I do remember that uh, that, that wave of uh, militarization and what they called victory frenzy, победа uh, in uh, Russian language. Uh, that um, that is something that actually, mm, as far as I know, as far as I understand, uh, didn't exist in Soviet Union. Uh, there was uh, some respect uh, to that uh, for example to the day to that victory day uh, and uh, to the um, uh, world war uh, the victory in world war ii uh, which they called great patriotic war in in russia uh, but uh, there was uh, nothing but respect but after the annexation of crimea uh, they needed that narrative about uh, russian uh, politicians they uh, putin uh, they needed that narratives to to take it out uh, narrative about great patriotic war. Uh, Russia, um, Russians are great uh, nation, and uh, they, um, uh, they they won that war. Uh, so uh, they needed it to. Uh, 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 they they needed it to um, to tell the people why uh, to support some uh, propaganda narratives about uh, about the annexation of Crimea, uh, and uh, that's uh, when uh, that all started. Uh, a lot of uh, tanks on the Moscow streets before the parade, uh, the rehearsals, and sometimes it was scary, even scary, uh, and uh, the military the level of military. Uh, they uh, started uh, dressing kids and that uh, very small kids, even uh, like very small kids uh, in the military uniform, uh, making tanks out of everything, uh, out of Russian blindly food and, and something like that. Uh, so the level uh, of militarization and that victory frenzy got to some uh, absurdity that the level of that absurdity was uh, incredible. Uh, and uh, now uh, they are still using that uh, that old narrative. They're still using that resource, uh, propaganda resource of uh, uh, great patriotic war. Uh, and uh, they, uh, yes, they they create those new symbols, uh, Z and V, and uh, they uh, line up uh, kids in the shape of Z or uh, in, in the shape of V. Uh, they have some special lessons, as I said before, uh, at school, some talks with uh, the Russian soldiers and uh, and so on. So they yes, they they push that uh, that narrative, that militarization even harder than it, uh, it it was before. But it started, I think, after the annexation of Crimea. And while we're talking about this propagandizing, another very disturbing aspect of what we've seen is Ukrainian children being used in propaganda spectacles, uh, either sort of filmed or interviewed. Uh, there was one last week with uh, Ukrainian children um, being forced to sit down with uh, a Russian military officer and basically being told that you know they were liberated, essentially liberated by their captors, liberated by the people who destroyed their cities and killed their relatives. Um, that's disturbing. But also a couple of months ago, we had Ukrainian children appearing in in a uh, in a stadium in Moscow. Again, um, huge pressure on these children. In this case, it was from Mariupol, which has been you know, destroyed uh, really to its foundations. Um, I mean, this this also fits. You know, the Geneva Convention states that you're not allowed to parade uh, soldiers in this way. And here we have children being used as sort of material for propaganda. Um, I mean, what's your what's your reaction when you see these things? And for you, do they also fit this criteria of genocidal behavior? I, yes, I, I think it fits this criteria. And I think it's uh, extremely cruel 
uh, to kids, not only kidnap them and erase their identity, uh, but also use them as a propaganda tool. But uh, they use Russian kids as well as uh, a propaganda tool all the time. And in general, they use uh, Putin uses uh, children uh, as a tool all the time. Uh, and has been using them for for many years, maybe since uh, that uh, law uh, was adopted, uh, Dima Yakovlev law, uh, and uh, they manipulate uh, kids. They are threatening parents, Rus Russian um, anti-war um, parents um, who are expressing their anti-war views. Uh, sometimes they're threatening them that they will take the kids away. So uh, children for uh, in um, ch children for the Russian government for the Russian regime uh, is is just a, it's just a tool uh, to support uh, the propaganda narratives uh, to uh, to uh, create some images they need uh, at the certain time. Uh, so they they use children uh, as a tool. Um, all the time in different situations. And uh, there was a very uh, important story. I think maybe you followed that story about Masha Moskalova, uh, a Russian teenager uh, who drew an entire war uh, picture uh, with, uh, with the Ukrainian flag. Uh, and it was just a peaceful, peaceful picture. There was nothing, no hate speech against uh, Russian people or anything like that. There was a Ukrainian flag and something about the peace and she wants the war to stop. Uh, and uh, the teacher uh, at school, uh, she reported her that she drew that picture. Uh, so uh, after that, the process started they, uh, against, uh, against uh, her father and uh, she lived with a single dad uh, because uh, her parents were divorced a long time ago and uh, mother left them uh, many years ago. And actually, ma the mother didn't uh, show any interest in Masha's life and uh, they were not communicating. And so she lived with, uh, with her dad. Uh, so they started uh, a process against her dad. They found uh, some his anti-war statements on social media. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, uh, he was uh, he was uh, sentenced uh, to um, I, I forgot to how many years in uh, in prison, but there, there was a sentence his father Alexei uh, received as a result uh, of uh, of that story. Uh, then he managed to escape to uh, so somewhere, but unfortunately he was uh, detained in Belarus, and now where uh, Alexei is, nobody knows. Uh, and they put Masha uh, into. Uh, so first of all, they wanted to put her into orphanage, uh, and there was a huge uh, resonance uh, because if people in Russia, although um, a lot of them are apathetic, they are not interested, uh, as they say, they're not interested in politics, they're trying to uh, stay away from the political questions, uh, so uh, all, when it has to do with kids, uh, Russian society uh, kind of uh, wakes up a little bit. Uh, and I saw it many times with Dima Yakovlev law, because uh, even those people uh, who were um, not in opposition, were very like apathetic again, uh, they stood up and they went to the process, protest. Because when it has to do with kids, they want to uh, uh, to stand up. Uh, and uh, there was a big resonance again um, about the story. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, that uh, woman, uh, Maria Lvova Belova, got involved into the story, and uh, Masha ended up in her mother's family. But nobody knows what really happened. How? Because obviously, her mom didn't want to take her. Uh, and uh, according to what I know, to people I uh, talk to, to the lawyers, uh, they say that it's highly likely that the local authorities from that region, they were told to uh, arrange that uh, somehow. Uh, and 
maybe they gave her money or I don't know how they uh, what they told her nobody knows and I don't want to uh, speculate on that but we know that Rush, uh, Masha ended up in that family uh, in the family of her mom um, and again they were not even communicating before and uh, the pictures after that um, they published a couple of pictures and they looked a little bit strange and I know that some activists were trying to call Masha but the mom uh, didn't didn't want her to talk to anyone, so nobody actually knows what is going on there. Uh, that is a very, mm, uh, very uh, good illustration of what uh, Russian authorities and Russian government are doing with kids and how they're using it uh, as a tool. Because after that, uh, I think the parents, single parents, or the parents, for example, with adopted kids, and I know from from my friends that they are thinking about it so they will think i i should be very cautious in what i say what i publish what i like on social media because they can come and take away my kids uh that's how they uh manipulate uh families and children and uh, they they uh, they make um, uh, children uh, host uh, hostages out of children mm -hmm. And we've seen that in previous years, even before the full-scale war, we've seen uh, that uh, parents who go to a protest and take their children have actually had their children taken away from them by Russian social services. So there is this, there is this threat uh, that we can we can essentially kidnap your children, we can take them away and punish you for any political activism. Well, I think the the area like I'd, I'd like to sort of end on is Ukraine is now contemplating victory. We don't know when that will come. We don't know what form that will take or how complete that victory will be. But many Ukrainians have, have told me that they will not get a sense that they're victorious until they've got all of the kids back. But what are the chances? It seems to me that it's going to be very difficult to get them all back. Uh, and it's going to be difficult to unite them with, uh, you know, with with friends, family, uh, relatives and guardians. And some of them, as in case in the orphanages, um, they don't have any of those connections either. And the institutions which they used to live in uh, may well have been destroyed in the fighting. So this is this is going to be a very difficult phase of any Ukrainian victory, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's true. And all the experts I talked to, including uh, that French uh, lawyer, Emmanuel Daoud, who initiated that uh, arrest warrant uh, against uh, Marie Lvova Belova and uh, uh, Putin, um, they uh, say that it will be extremely difficult uh, because uh, they, uh, uh, I mean, Russians have changed the uh, children's names already, some of them. Uh, so it's it will be, a, and they also send them to different regions. So it will be difficult to locate them. Uh, but uh, again, there are different groups of children. There, there are children who are not orphans. They have families and uh, uh, the um, international uh, activists uh, and uh, lawyers and um, society just in, in general uh, can help uh, those families to reunite. Uh, as for the orphans, it's a different uh, situation and it's um, it's more difficult uh, in my opinion. Um, uh, but uh, it's also very important to try to do everything to get the orphans back. Uh, and one of the reasons is uh, Dima Yakovlev law, uh, because according to Dima Yakovlev law, uh, in foreign uh, parents, uh, especially uh, parents from families from the United States, uh, cannot adopt Russian children. Uh, and uh, so the chances of being adopted decreased uh, significantly for those children uh, for those orphans uh, in Russia. Uh, for Russian orphans, they were already uh, low because they um, they cannot be adopted by by the American families, but they take those chances from Ukrainian kids as well, uh, who could be adopted by the American families. And it's known that uh, American families um, have been adopting uh, Ukrainian uh, kids and Russian kids before Dima Yakovlev law. 
uh, with uh, some health, serious health issues. Uh, those uh, that kind of issues that uh, in Russia they are not dealing, they cannot deal with, uh, and uh, a lot of Russian families they just cannot adopt uh, kids like that because they don't have enough money. Uh, they don't know uh, there is a lot of prejudice uh, stereotypes in the society because society will treat them bad and uh, they don't have any uh, emotional financial resource for that. But the American parents used to adopt them. Uh, and now they, uh, with the annexation of Crimea, they took those chances from the Crimean kids, from the kids, orphans from Donbass, and now from other Ukrainian regions. So it's very important to get those kids back. Uh, but as you said, uh, I agree it will be very, very difficult because if they change uh, the names uh, and the location and all the paperwork, um, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But uh, that's why I think uh, it's uh, very important that um, a lot of journalists uh, from Ukraine uh, and from uh, from Russia, I mean, they are outside Russia now, but they're still working uh, on investigating uh, those cases. And there are a lot of investigations um, being published. Uh, and I think it's a very, very uh, important part of that work to get uh, kids back. And that's why I think, you know, conversations like this are so important because this topic does not get, uh, does not get the sort of coverage in the media, which I think it deserves. Um, it's an absolutely tragic story. And I think it's something that every single Ukrainian is acutely aware of, that these children need to be returned. And that is a key part of their eventual victory in this war. Well, Ksenia, thank you so much for going through this really tough topic with us. And as this story unfolds, as hopefully more children return, then it'd be good to return back to this topic and get a progress update uh, in a couple of months. Thank you. Thanks for having me.